Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the latest in the CEDA webinar series. And we're going to be talking today about the tool Git and its associated web service, GitHub. Um, I'm here today with my colleagues, Poppy Townsend. Um, I'm Ag Stevens, and I'm here with Richard Smith. Um, Poppy is, is organising our webinar series, and as you can see at the bottom here, her email address is on there as a, a feedback if you want to send questions in. Um, I'll be giving a general introduction, and Richard will be dealing with most of the detail um, during our talk. We're all part of the Centre for Environmental Data Analysis, or CEDA, um, and we're part of STFC. So we have an hour scheduled, um, so that's plenty of time for us to, to work through our presented material and then um, hopefully give you enough time to ask questions and for us to respond to those during the hour. Um, we should stress that if you're watching this live, please send any questions you have into Poppy at this email address here. And as I mentioned, down at the bottom of every slide, you can see Poppy's email address. Um, please do not use the question box um, that you see on the webinar tool. Um, unfortunately, we can't access this in real time. So if you have any questions, send them in. We'll keep track of them and answer them at the end. If you're watching a recording of the webinar, then please send your questions in to our standard CEDA help desk which is support at cedar.ac.uk. And Poppy will also be sending out a feedback form during the webinar. So um, at the end, please let us know what you think. So today we're going to cover the topics of what version control is and why we think it's a good idea to use it. I will then introduce um, Git at a high level and talk about code repositories. Um, and then Richard will go into more detail about GitHub and how we can use that to, to manage online repositories. Um, and then we go into the more detail about Git as a command line tool, how you use it, um, some of the, the basic commands, um, a few other features of Git, and then at the end, um, we'll show a list of further information and resources that you can um, go back and refer to at your leisure. Now, Git is quite a big topic. Um, we say it's easy to use, but that's only once you've had some practice and you've got used to working with it. So it's important for you to know that, that these slides and this video has been made available um, the slides have been made available before the webinar and will remain available along with the recording of this. And when we get to the end of the talk, there are a page of links that includes um, documentation, a cheat sheet, and um, tutorials that you can go away and look at. The key thing is that, that you really need to get some hands-on experience um, to understand what this is all about. So our main message is you don't need to get it now to be able to get it. So please go away, try things out, and, and please ask us questions if you get stuck. So if we start from the very top, what is version control and why do we think it's a good idea? Well, we can think of version control as simply some software that is tracking the history of a single file or a directory or folder if you're in Windows speak, um, and it records who made the changes, when they were made, and what changes were made. So it's simply about recording the, the differences over time of the code and the files that you're working with. You may ask, why should I use version control? Well, we think there are lots of reasons. One of the most simple is that in our careers, we've probably all lost um, files. We've probably all lost information that we, we, were, that we hadn't saved or hadn't backed up and we've lost track of it. So version control gives you a way of having a backup of your code and potentially storing that off-site as well. It allows you to keep track of different versions. Um, so we can think of versions in time 
so how your code evolves over time. And we can think of it in terms of different branches, so different routes that you might take in parallel. Um, so version control can keep all of those things for you. It's a really good way of allowing you to share code with other people. And then that moves on to the idea that you can co-develop with other authors. So we really recommend version control systems as a way to collaborate with other people. So if we drill down a bit, if we think about backup and version history, knowing that you've got that gives you the confidence to be able to test ideas, to develop new things in the knowledge that you can roll back to any point in time into the history of your code base. So one day you might come along and say, well, I think I've done this wrong or I think I need to take a different approach. You know that you've got persistent versions that are committed to your history that you can get to at any point. And version control systems make it really easy to record the changes that you make along the way. And what's more, if you have multiple versions, so if you have parallel branches where different things have been developed, version control systems have a whole heap of tools that allow you to resolve any conflicts when you want to merge those different things together. We also mentioned sharing code. And in fact, publishing code is another aspect of this. So collaboration these days often requires us to be able to share code efficiently with other people. Um, Git and GitHub are two tools that make that really easy. The, in this day and age, when we are writing funding proposals or maybe writing um, publications for, journal, for journals, um, funders and institutions often require us to be able to publish our code. Um, and ver version control systems make all this stuff really easy. They allow us to branch, they allow us to merge different branches together, different changes together, and they allow us to document and commit our changes along the way. Um, and one really key aspect of this is that you can create fixed versions and you can tag them and, and call them releases. So you'll have worked with different software along the way. Software typically has some kind of release tag which has information about what's been changed between versions and version control systems make that really easy. So here's just a picture of, of how we can think about how version control systems can help us. So if we start at the top here, we have some repository and, and let's pretend over on the left hand side, um, this is Poppy developer A, um, who is working on a new feature of a website that we've got together. And on the right hand side, we have Richard developer B, who is, is fixing a bug. So we could imagine that, that over on the left hand side here, Poppy's just wanting to add a new page to the website and maybe some new images. Um, so she can take her own branch and she can develop these things along the way. And you can see each of these blue dots. We can think of those as a, as a, a commit point, a point in history that you could return to if you need to. On the right hand side, um, Richard's found there was a few typos on, on some of the pages. So he's gone in and just edited some files that already exist. And the key thing about using tools like Git is that when it comes to the point where you need to bring this work together and you need to potentially um, merge these things together, there are a whole heap of, of nice features that make that really easy to do. And really importantly, you can make sure that the history that's gone on in both of these different branches can all be brought together in a way that makes sense in a way that's easy for, for you and other people to be able to go back to and understand. So let's talk a little bit about Git now and about Git repositories. So if we think about what a Git repository is, it's simply a directory tree that contains files and potentially subdirectories and files or directories within those. It contains the information about the history of all those files and directories. And it contains also a set of information that helps you navigate across different versions. So again, we can think about the evolution over time, um, but we can also think about different routes that you might take or different branches that different developers are taking. And a Git repository keeps track of all of those things. So why do we tell you to use Git? Um, there are lots of different 
um, version control systems out there. We expect that you'll have heard of Subversion or SVN, um, which is, is very popular, but we would say that Git is the, um, the strongest option in this day and age, and, and there are various reasons why we say that. So we think it's more useful for collaboration. It's distributed and fast, and I'll tell you a bit more about what we mean by that in a minute. It's very well supported in terms of the tooling um, around, sort of ecosystem of tools around Git. And it has these free um, web services that provide online repositories and a whole heap of other tools and features. So you may have heard of GitHub and Bitbucket. We recommend GitHub. Um, you can use lots of different ones, but, but in our webinar, we're gonna just focus on the use of GitHub. So what do we mean by distributed? The key thing here is that every copy of a Git repository, be it on Richard's machine, Poppy's machine, on my machine, or up on GitHub, um, every single copy is a complete copy of the repository. So that's a copy of, of all the history and all the different commit points um, over time. So that actually, if my machine completely crashed and Richard's machine crashed, we could say that Poppy's version of the repository um, was the primary version and each of us could then clone a copy to our systems and work from that again. So that's what we mean by distributed. However, many people like to have a centralized server, like to say that there is a specific version that we call our, our central or, or default version of the repository. And typically, we use GitHub to do this. So GitHub is a web service running on the cloud and many of us decide that that is where we keep the, the sort of pristine online version of our repository. And each of us can take a copy and work with it ourselves. So I'm gonna hand you over to Richard now who will, will take us deeper into understanding GitHub. Okay, so this is GitHub. As you can see, it's a website. And it, you can access it by going to github.com. Um, so we're just going to go through a few bits about what is GitHub, um, how you get an account, some basic usage. So what is GitHub? It's a web-based Git repository hosting service. So GitHub allows you to share your repositories with others, access other users' repositories, store remote copies as a backup of your local repositories, add bug tracking, feature requests, and wikis. So we're not gonna talk about those today, and maybe we'll cover them in a future webinar, but there's lots of rich features that can be added on your Git repository using a web service such as GitHub. And another thing, GitHub is completely free unless you want private repositories. One thing to clear up, Git versus GitHub, they sound very similar, um, but they are two different things. So Git is a revision control system a tool to manage your source code history. So Git is your command line interface that you'd use on your local machine, on your laptop or your desktop. And GitHub is the web hosting service where you can put Git repositories. So they are not the same thing. Git is the tool, GitHub is a web service. And one thing, so Ag's already mentioned that you can use them independently. You do not need GitHub to use Git. But like I said, GitHub adds lots of useful functionality on top. So let's just run through a few steps of what will, what's going to happen if you set up a GitHub account um, and just explain the pages that you will see. So in order to get an account, if you just go to github.com, um, the big form on the right highlighted in red, that is your, your sign-up form. So if you fill that in, and then follow the on-screen instructions. So one of the things you'll need to do is verify your email address. And then you'll be presented with a screen that looks like this. So this is, if you haven't got any code, then you'll see this. And um, one thing to highlight there, on that splash page, there is actually a tutorial. So if, when you go in and if you've run through these slides and you still don't fully understand what's going on, you can go through the GitHub tutorial there and that'll give you a, a starting place to, to learn how to um, begin using GitHub. In order to create a new repository, you click the plus icon up at the top and then just click the new repository button there. This will bring you a new page um, where you can get some basic information about your repository. So for example, you need to give it a name. I've gone for example repo. And then there's a box down here which says initialize repository with a readme. Uh, if you're just starting out, this is a good thing to tick. Um, and I'll show you why in a second. 
Then you click Create Repository. So this is what your repository will look like after you've created it. So you can see at the top there, you've got your username. So that's me, rsmith013, and my repository name, example repo. On the next line down, you have a few tabs with some extra settings for the repository. So the one we're going to focus on today is that first one, the code, um, which is what you can see now. But if you uh, tab through, you can see other other sections there. So issues we'll talk about in another webinar, but that allows you to do issue tracking and, and settings on the repository. This next section down here tells you more information about your repository. So you can see we've got one commit and that was our readme file, which was created at the beginning and one branch. And this section here shows you what's in it. So at the moment, like I said, we've just got this one file, this readme, and that is displayed here. So that's why it's a good reason to have a readme file. It allows you can, to write some information about what your repository is, what's in it, and maybe how to use it, and some basic information that people will want to read as they come across your repository to understand what it is. Okay, so now that's GitHub. Now we're gonna go into Git the tool. So first things first, uh, you wanna find out whether it's actually installed on your computer. So if you open up a terminal, and just go to the command line and type git space dash dash version. If you get something back, then you have git installed. Um, if it says something like cannot find git, then uh, you'll need to go and install it. So the link there, git stmcom slash downloads has loads of different um, downloads for each of the major distributions of Windows, Macs and Linux. Um, and if you go through there, it just has instructions of how to install it on your, on your machine. So once you've got it installed, you can get down to using it. So uh, what, we've created a repository on GitHub. Now you wanna clone it to your local computer. So what you do is you click the big green button that says clone or download, and that will bring down a drop down box. Um, and if you click that little copy icon in the corner, then that will copy the URL. <coughs> then if you open a terminal window, you can use the git clone command. So first thing you want to do is make sure in the directory where you want to put your repository. Then you use git clone followed by the URL which you just copied from GitHub. Sometimes you may find a repository that requires authentication. If that is the case, you can just put your GitHub username just before uh, github.com between the HTTPS slash slash um, and then that will require your password once you press enter. So this is what happens if you do git clone. So um, you type git clone and your URL, press return, and then you'll get some uh, text on the screen. It doesn't really matter necessarily what that means. Um, just know that if it says done, 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 then that's a good thing. Um, and if you type ls to list what's in your directory, you should see your repository name there. So wherever you are, it creates a directory called the repository. So here are a few basic commands that you might use every day. So we've gone through git clone, um, which clone copies a remote repository to your computer. Um, there's git status, which is very useful. It shows the status of your local repository. Git add, that will add changes to git. And then git commit, so that's essentially like a save. So that commits your, local, your changes locally. And then git push, that puts it back onto GitHub or whatever your remote um, repository is. So we're going to go through those commands in the context of a sort of an everyday, um, something you might do every day to, to edit and update your files. So getting on with it. Now you've cloned your repository to a computer, we'll go through how to use Git while developing code. So first off, let's add a file. So we're going to change directory into our directory called example repo. I'm going to create a file called newfile.py and add some code. So I've just had some very basic print statement here. And then we can check what we've done using git status. So if we do an ls, we now see so we've got a readme, which we had before, and this newfile.py. So if you do git status, it tells you some information about where you are. So it says you're on the master branch, which is the main one, and that you're up to date with the, the uh, remote repository. But it also says there are some untracked files which are highlighted in red. So that's saying there's something here which is different to the current version that you have 
in your uh, committed history and it even tells you what to do. So it says git add file to include what will be committed. So we'll go through that next. So then you do git add. Uh, that little dot there is important. That means git add everything here, basically. Uh, once you do that, if you type git status again, then it won't say, so before on the last screen it said untracked files. On this screen it says changes to be committed. And you can set up so that your command line shows it in colors. So it would turn green if you've got that set up and red if it's uncommitted. And then what we want to do is we want to essentially save our changes. So we can use git commit minus m. So if we type that in the command line, git commit minus m, and then you want to add some useful message to describe what you've done. Um, and once you press return on that, it will say one file changed, one insertion, and it's created new file. So now if you type git status, it will say you're on the master branch as before, but you're now ahead by one commit from your uh, remote repository. And um, so I use minus M there. Uh, that just means you can add an inline message. So that using the, the, the quotes there, um, if, you take, if you don't use minus M, then if you've got it set up correctly, it will open up an editor so you can write more lines and maybe format it a bit differently. And um, there's a little note there at the bottom. So if it doesn't work, you might need to export your editor. Um, but you can find information about that. So the next thing to do is git push. So that pushes it to your remote repository. So in this case, we're talking about GitHub. Um, so if you just type git push, then it tells you some information. You don't need to know what that means. I don't even know what that means, and it doesn't matter. Um, what's important is at the end, it just says that it's done it. Um, and if you type git status, it will say it's up to date with the master branch. So now if you go back to GitHub, you can see that, that new file.py has been added. And the commit message is in the middle bit there. So it says added new file.py to print string. Okay, so now it's going to changing a file. So let's say you want to edit that file now. So we've opened up the new file.py again, and we've changed it to here is some different code. So now if we type git status again, we'll see that it's been modified. And then, so last time we did lots of git statuses just to show you the process, but you don't need to do that every time. So here we've got the full flow. So you've changed the file and you do git add dot. So that adds the file. Then you git commit minus m with your message. So we've said we modified the string to say something different. And that tells you that it's updated it. And then you git push to push it back to GitHub. And then you can see, so again, our message down here is what we just wrote. So modify string to say something different. And up here now it says three commits. So the first commit was adding the readme file. The second commit was adding new file. And the third commit was editing that new file. So if you click on the three commits, it shows you the history. So here is the history of what we've done. And like I said, the first one, with an initial commit, then, so this is why the messages are important. So then you can look back at history, you can see what you've actually done. So it's important to write useful messages that help you when you're looking back. So here's a couple of questions that are commonly asked. Uh, one is, do I always need to clone? And the answer is no. Once you've cloned to your computer, you don't need to do that step again. So the initial clone phase, once you've taken it down from GitHub onto your computer, then it's there and you don't need to clone it again. And one very important one is how often should I commit? And the answer is more often than you think. Um, I had a bit of discussion with my colleagues and we came up with the answer of once you've done one thing that works. So whether that's one bug fix or one new function or one new class, um, one new file, one new feature. So one, one thing, if you can say you've done a thing and it works, then that's when you should commit and write a meaningful message to say what you've done. The more often you commit, the easier it will be to go back and, and see your history. And um, if you find mistakes, it's easier to go back on smaller incremental changes rather than waiting until you get to the end of the project, committing everything, and you've got no steps in between. So commit more often than you think. And another thing that is commonly asked is what's the difference between git add, git commit, and git push? So hopefully this slide will help you a little bit. Um, Git add tells you what tells Git what you want it to track. 
So until you've done git add, it doesn't know, it's not watching it basically. So that little dot means everything, like I said, git commit is essentially a save. So that saves the current state of your tracked files with a message and that saves it in your, on your local computer. And then git push, that synchronizes the changes from your local computer to GitHub or whatever other remote service you're using. So now we're gonna go through a couple of extra useful commands. So here we have um, git pull. So we've done git push and that pushes changes from your computer to GitHub. But sometimes if someone else has made some changes and pushed it to GitHub, then it's possible that GitHub will be further ahead than your version on your computer. So in order to bring the changes down from GitHub to your computer, then you can use git pull. Um, git diff is also very helpful. That allows you to see what you've changed since the last commit. So if you've done some edits and then you've gone away, you weren't finished, you've gone away and you've come back and you can't quite remember what you did. If you type git diff, it will show you everything you've added, everything you've deleted, everything that's changed. So it's very easy to, to see what's different between your current working copy and the last save point or commit. Um, sometimes it's, you might want to remove a file from a local repository and that is accomplished using git rm. Another thing that's also really useful, so let's say if you tried something out and you decided it wasn't working and you wanted to go in a different direction. And so you essentially want to undo everything that you've done. And what you can do is you can type git checkout dash dash dot. So that essentially means um, go back to the previous save point and reset everything. And then another useful thing. So we've talked about taking things from GitHub to your local computer. You can also go the other way. Um, so if you wanted, to, or if you don't want to use GitHub at all, then you can use git init on your directory or your folder. And that allows you to keep track of the history on your local computer without even using GitHub. So you can still go through the git add, git commit cycle, um, and you've got a uh, history there preserved on your machine. So let's go into detail a little bit more about those commands. So git pull, like I said, that will bring changes from the re remote repository, e.g. GitHub, into your local one. And git will merge the changes with your local version if there are no conflicts. If there are conflicts, it will tell you that, and then it will put um, messages inside your code, which you can go through and uh, correct. And also, if you, like I said, if you want to see the changes that you've made, then you use git diff. So let's say um, I open a file called newfile.txt and I add a line, nobody expects a Spanish inquisition. So if I type git diff now, then it will show the changes between the last save state or commit and the current working state. So you can see below git diff and it shows you that you've added the line, nobody expects a Spanish inquisition in newfile.txt. And to delete a file, so git rm, so that removes files from a working directory. Removals like additions need to be committed, so you'll still need to do git add, git commit. Um, and history is preserved, so if you've, if you've deleted a file, then you can go back to a previous commit and that file will still be there. And in order to undo local changes, then we can use git checkout. So use to reset the working state back to the last commit, so you do git checkout dash dash dot and that's essentially an undo button. If you only want to do it on a specific file, so the dot means everything here. If you use, uh, if you specify a file name, then it will undo the changes on a specific file rather than everything. So that can be used if you've only edited, if you've edited more than one file, but you only want to reset one, then you can use git checkout dash dash the file name. And if you want to create a repo on your machine without using GitHub or go start it on your computer first before pushing it to GitHub, then you can use git init. Now I'm going to pass back to Ag to describe some more other features of Git. So I'm just going to talk about <clears throat> two other useful features of Git that, that might come in handy when you're getting started. So the first of them is the git ignore file. And then um, the other is setting your username and email. So if you create a .git ignore file um, at the top level of your Git repository, so inside the, the main directory of your Git repository, 
Um, this is a, a really useful feature that allows you to essentially hide things from Git. So say you had um, some important secrets such as passwords or, or secret keys for your server um, and they lived inside some file or some folder inside your repository. You can just list um, the location of those things or you can list um, particular glob patterns, um, sort of regular expression patterns to tell Git to ignore them. Um, this might also be useful for things like data or output directories or places where you've got temporary or compiled files. So in this example, um, those of you that work with Python are probably used to seeing .pyc files. So these are bytecode um, compiled files that Python will compile on the fly and store on the file system. We don't want these in our Git repository because we only want the code in our Git repository. So if we put a star.pyc um, line in our .gitignore file, it will tell the Git repository to just ignore all of those. It, it won't tell us about those when we use Git status and we won't accidentally add them to the repository. Um, here we've got an app directory with a secrets.txt file where we might have some passwords or sensitive, sensitive information. Again, this will tell Git to ignore that. And then we can imagine that the temp underscore data is some kind of output directory where we're writing files. And it's perfectly acceptable to want to write files and an output inside the directory that is also a Git repository, but we don't want to end up committing terabytes of, of output data to our Git repository so we can just tell it to ignore it with that. Another thing that Git tends to prompt you to do when you, you first set things up is it, it gives you um, an option of setting a global username and global email address. Um, so Git stores information inside a, a, got, a, a dot .git directory within your repository, but it also can potentially store information inside your home directory in a, in a dot .git directory. So if you want all your Git repositories to know who you are, so that when you make a commit message, um, so we talked earlier on about when you do a commit, the minus M option, that's telling, telling the repository, this is some information about the change I've made. If there's more than one person committing to the repository, it's really useful if we know who made those changes. So if you do git config dash dash global user.name, um, you can add your username in there. And again, you can add your email with git config dash dash global user.email and give it your email address. And once you've done this once on a, on a given system, it will remember it for all your interactions with different Git repositories. So it's really useful to do this as a one-off. And that makes sure that any commit messages are tagged with your information. So we've given you a, a tour of why we think version control is a good idea, what it's all about. Um, we've talked about code repositories and that each code repository is essentially a directory or, or a folder. Um, we've talked about Git, the command line tool that allows you to uh, manage a repository, make changes, track changes, and also push that information to remote repositories. Um, we've talked about GitHub as a web service where you can manage your online remote repositories and you can um, create releases and you can track the history and you can collaborate very effectively with other people. Um, then Richard's um, mentioned a lot of detail about the, the basic workflow of, of using Git at the command line. Um, as we said earlier on, there's a lot of information there and really the only way you can, can get to grips with this stuff is to try it yourself, install Git, do some very simple testing in the way that we've demonstrated here. Um, and that should, that should give you the experience you need and the confidence to, to go on and use it more. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, the, this video, this presentation will be made available um, via our standard location at this URL. And here's a collection of resources that you might want to go away and, and look at in more detail and read up on. So if you just want the, the standard Git documentation, 
and there's plenty of that at this first um, link here. GitHub, you find at um, https um, colon forward slash forward slash github.com. Um, there's a URL to a Git cheat sheet. That's quite nice because it just tries to give you the basics of what you want to do in your everyday workings with Git. And there's also a nice um, Git basic starter course um, at Code Academy, um, which at the time of, of presenting this, there was a seven day free trial on. So you could um, look at working with that.